Uh, dear professors, dear colleagues, dear guests of the webinar, it's my honor to start our Meet the Expert session number five. As you know, Meet the Expert sessions are organized within the program of the Master of Sciences in Clinical Mental Health um, uh, of the Faculty of Medicine of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki and Professor Konstantinos Funtulakis as the main uh, supervisor of this program. Uh, this program is um, managed by the World Psychiatric Association 2020-2023 Action Plan Group on Evidence-Based Psychopharmacology and within the activities of the World Psychiatric Association section on the evidence-based psychiatry. During previous Meet the Expert uh, webinars, we enjoyed the lectures delivered by such prominent speakers as Professor Robin Murray, Peter Falkai, Siegfried Kasper, Richard Lam, Daryl Roger, Heinz Krunze, Roger McIntyre, Dries Musai. And today it's a very important topic, which is devoted to the problem of suicides and suicidality. We are privileged to introduce um, our speakers, Professor Ross Baldessarini from Harvard Medical School, United States, and Professor Zoltan Rimer from Semmelweis University in Hungary. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to Professor uh, Afzal Javed, who is the president of the World Psychiatric Association. Uh, Professor Afzal Javed, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, very distinguished speakers and experts. And thank you very much, Daria, for giving a very uh, detailed uh, introduction about the series, Meet the Experts. I must say the whole credit goes to Professor Fontelakis and his team, because uh, World Psychiatric Association is interested to disseminate and support the spread of scientific knowledge. Although COVID-19 has restricted ourselves, but at least this has given us a new insight how to reach most of the world by sitting in your own homes. And as uh, Daria was mentioning, this is the fifth event in the series. And we were lucky that uh, each series was attended by hundreds of participants. And we do hope that today's topic, which is very relevant, very important, and is going to be discussed and delivered by world experts on this particular topic, will generate more discussions and more interest. I, on my personal behalf and on behalf of WPA, would like to thank the organizers, but more importantly, our honorable speakers for sparing time and giving us their expertise to share their views with others. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you very much, Professor Afzal Javed, for your, your words and uh, support of uh, the webinars and this educational program. And today we will also hear the commentaries from Professor Konstantinos Fontolakis and from uh, Professor Peter Morozov, who is the General Secretary of the World Psychiatric Association. And now it's my pleasure um, to give the floor to Professor Eva Maria Tsapakis, who will introduce our first speaker, Professor Rosbal de Sarini. The floor is yours. Prof. Thank Eva. you, Professor Smirnova. Uh, it is a great honor and uh, a, a delight to uh, be here today uh, to be introducing Professor Rosbal Desserini to the fifth Meet the Expert webinar. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Funtulakis for organizing uh, this initiative uh, on, on behalf of WPA and uh, the Aristotle University. Professor Baldessarini uh, was born to an Italian family in Western Massachusetts. He graduated from Williams College with highest honors in chemistry in 1959. He completed medical education at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where he began training in neuroscience with Professor Mount Vernon Mountcastle. He spent a year at NIH with doctors Seymour Ketty. Julius Axelrod and Erwin Coppin in neuropharmacology, 
And after graduation, he completed internship at Boston City Hospital in internal medicine, and then returned to the NM NIMH for additional research fellowship training in biochemical neuropharmacology. He then returned to Johns Hopkins Hospital for clinical training in psychiatry and was chief resident of the Henry Phipps Psychiatric Clinic there until 1969. He moved to Massachusetts General Hospital in 69 to help Professor Ketty establish the laboratories for psychiatric research, and he never left. He moved to the Mailman Research Center at McLean in 1977 with the uh, Laboratories for Psychiatric Research, and he became his di the, uh, their director after Dr. Ketty's retirement in 1983. In 1988, he was named permanent director of the laboratories, as well as the founding director of the new bipolar and psychotic disorder programs at McLean Hospital, where in 1989, he also became co-director of psychopharmacology and psychopharmacology training. He founded the International Consortium for Mood and Psychotic Disorders Research there in 1995 with colleagues from all over the world. He's internationally known research psychopharmacologist with many contributions to the actions of antipsychotic and mood stabilizing medicines and has trained over 160 laboratory and clinical investigators. Professor Baldessarini has over 2,200 publications, including chapters on psychopharmacology in Goodman and Gilman's, the pharmacological basis of therapeutics textbook for several years, as well as on his own monograph, Chemotherapy in Psychiatry. He has served on editorial boards of leading neuroscience and psychiatric research journals. <clears throat> His seminal work on, on the applications of lithium in psychiatry spans over 60 years. And if, if I'm not mistaken, he is the person who introduced lithium to psychiatry first. His recognitions include election to the scholars of Johns Hopkins University, the Efron Research Prize from the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology, the Falcon Prize for Bipolar Disorders Research of the American National Alliance for Research in Schizophrenia and Depression, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention Research Prize on Anti-Suicide Effects of Lithium, the first McLean Hospital Cataldo Prize for Mentoring, the Harvard Medical School William Silent Lifetime Achievement Excellence in Mentoring Award, the ISI list of most often cited authors in pharmacology and psychiatry, the Morgan Shue Award for Lifetime Teaching and Training on Bipolar Disorder for the International Society of Bipolar Disorders, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the University of Rome. I first met Professor Baldessarini in 95, when as a final year medical student from London, I applied to join his neuropharmacology labs at the Mailman Research Center in Belmont uh, for the first five months of my final year elective period of study. I was involved in place preference experiments testing potential therapeutic molecules. Fatherly, as he was and is, being genuinely interested in his students and collaborators, he adopted me, may I dare say, and I have ever since enjoyed the privilege of a most valuable mentorship experience, among others. In Loco Parentis, on the other side of the pond, Ross advised me on several career, but also personal decisions. He subsequently accepted me to return to McLean as a fellow during the 2003-2004 school year. Ross is an avid reader with an inquiring mind. He taught himself German to read Kreppling from the original. He taught me Areteus from the original too, a humbling but awesome experience for a Greek, among others I had close to him. I last saw him at Cape Cod in the summer of 2017, where I followed his highly acclaimed week-long clinical psychopharmacology overview and recent advances course, which pans for decades and I strongly recommend. But the floor is to him, and we all look forward to listening to the topic of suicide update on basic facts. Ross. Yes, well, we thank you uh, for, uh, for listening. I'm uh, deeply uh, pleased and honored to be uh, asked to speak today. Um, I uh, am very appreciative to the 
uh, World Psychiatric Association and to uh, Professor Fontalakis for the invitation. And I must uh, state in the beginning that I do not consider myself an expert on this topic. Uh, I, I may know a little bit about some parts of psychiatry, but uh, suicide for me has been a kind of a sideline for a relatively short time. And I feel that I'm still very much at the uh, student stage of learning uh, some of the uh, important basics in the field. So that's where I intend to uh, focus my attention today and kind of review uh, some very, very basic uh, information. And I, uh, I apologize to any real experts who may be uh, listening that this may be a little too basic, but uh, I think it's sometimes useful to have a uh, common starting point for uh, problems of this type. I wanted to uh, begin by making a, a, a general point that I think that one of the uh, things that psychiatry has not paid sufficient attention to is that our illnesses, especially the major illnesses, the psychoses and the major mood disorders, are potentially lethal disorders. And we all know about uh, risk of suicide, and that's uh, mainly what I'm going to talk about today, but I, I want to make the more general point that is illustrated in this uh, classic study from Sweden by uh, Professor Ursby, uh, making the point that if you consider, for example, among bipolar disorder patients, uh, their premature uh, death rates, it turns out that if you look at the overall lifetime uh, risk, uh, the number of deaths in excess of usual due to medical illnesses is very, very similar uh, to rates uh, of, of suicide. In fact, the uh, medical deaths uh, are somewhat higher than suicide. They're about equal to violent forms of death of all kinds, including uh, accidents and, and uh, homicides and other forms of violence. So the, the general point is that I think the field has done a lot uh, to uh, investigate suicide and to try to kind of, uh, come up with uh, therapeutic interventions that might prevent suicide. Uh, we're not doing as well, I think, uh, on the medical side, especially among older patients. Uh, uh, the general treatment of the disorders, I believe, helps and can reduce overall mortality. But to focus on uh, death rates and, and reduce them as a, as a specific therapeutic target, I think, is something that needs a lot more attention and, and work. Now, the next thing I want to turn to is to make a small complaint, uh, <clears throat> and I guess I can do this as an academic. Uh, I really don't like the term suicidality. And the reason I don't like it is because it gets uh, in the way of understanding uh, some things that are clinically very important. And suicidality includes a, an enormously broad range of uh, thoughts and behaviors, uh, starting with suicidal ideation, thoughts about dying or wishing to be dead. And that occurs uh, in a very, very large uh, proportion of the population. And these are recent US data. This is a, a semi-quantitative Venn diagram. And uh, some 11 million uh, Americans in a year's time uh, acknowledge that they've thought about uh, wishing to die or even uh, ending their lives at some point. Uh, about a third of them uh, actually develop specific concrete plans to harm themselves. And about a, uh, about a million, million and a half will make uh, an attempt uh, to uh, harm themselves uh, with suicidal intent. And if you look at that little black uh, circle in the middle, that's the actual uh, number of suicides. And the point here is that suicides are relatively infrequent out of the whole family of suicidal uh, 
uh, phenomenon. Uh, I think one of the more interesting ones for me is uh, we focused a lot recently on the ratio of attempts to suicides, uh, the so-called AS ratio. In the uh, normal and the general population, that ratio runs between 30 and 40. So that means you, you have about 30 to 40 attempts for every fatality in the general population. Now in the uh, uh, psychiatric population, for example, among folks with mood disorders, that ratio drops below 10. And I've seen numbers as low as five uh, in severely ill, depressed, and bipolar disorder patients. And we've been proposing this ratio as, a, as an index of lethality. Uh, one of the ways it can be useful is that we've found that uh, in addition to reducing rates of attempts and suicides, uh, we've been able to show changes in the ratio of attempt to suicide. For example, uh, treatment with lithium and bipolar disorder raises the uh, attempt to suicide ratio considerably. Uh, that, that is, it seems to reduce lethality as well as uh, having a strong impact on the uh, behaviors. Now, <clears throat> one of the important uh, lessons that we learned, this is a recent uh, study carried out uh, with uh, Professor Tondo, who works in our department part of each year. He runs a mood disorder clinic in Cagliari in Sardinia. And we've put together a huge uh, database uh, looking at uh, risk of suicides and attempts among people with different psychiatric uh, diagnoses. And we've compared men and women. And the usual story is that uh, rates of uh, attempts are somewhat higher usually in women. Rates of fatality from suicide uh, consistently several times higher in men than in women in most cultures. Uh, one notable exception to that rule, uh, I've seen data from uh, People's Republic of China, where particularly in rural areas, uh, there are more suicides among women than among men, uh, largely among uh, impoverished rural uh, populations. And the deaths are usually due to overdoses of uh, agricultural uh, toxins, uh, insecticides, and things of that kind. But in most cultures, uh, certainly in Europe and North America, uh, it's much more likely uh, suicide among men than among women. Now, if you look at the uh, list of diagnoses in this graph, uh, bipolar disorder is at the top of the uh, uh, list of, of uh, major disorders. And even among bipolar patients, uh, there are subgroups that are at particularly high risk. Uh, bipolar patients with psychotic features uh, have very high risk. Uh, mixed features where there's both uh, depression and, and increased energy and, and hypomanic or manic features mixed together. Uh, this is what I call a combination of uh, misery plus energy. That's uh, high risk for, for suicide. Uh, we find that in bipolar 1, the risk of suicide is a bit higher than in bipolar 2, but they're very similar. And this is one of the uh, uh, things we've been arguing recently that bipolar disorder, contrary to what many of us were taught in medical school and residency, bipolar 2 is not a lesser disease. Uh, it's a different condition, and there's a, there are a lot of clinical features that are different. But in terms of disability uh, and fatality risk, uh, bipolar 2 is uh, very bad news. Psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia have elevated risk, but not as high as in the mood disorders. You may be puzzled as to why major depression is at the lower end of this uh, ranking. And the reason for that is that samples of uh, major depression patients include uh, inpatients, outpatients, and everybody in between. So it means there's an enormous range of illness severity. If you look uh, at uh, major depression patients who were sick enough to require hospitalization at some point, then their risks begin to uh, become very close uh, 
to the risks in bipolar disorder. So again, depression is important, but again, but it depends uh, greatly on, on severity. And then you'll see at the bottom of the list, uh, the anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder have much uh, lower risk. Now, this is a uh, recent set of uh, uh, information from the uh, CDC uh, federal uh, data collections that they pull together every year. And for many years, uh, in the United States at least, uh, suicide death by firearm has been the leading uh, cause, particularly among men. Um, hanging is number two, poisoning uh, number three among men, uh, poisoning is number two among women, uh, jumping from heights, car wrecks, that sort of thing are, are further down the list. Now, the problem with this is that the United States is a peculiar culture, and it's a culture that uh, in which firearms have a very prominent place. We have a very strong uh, gun, gun culture. Uh, there's a fascination with firearms that, that has an enormous uh, uh, political implication and social implications in addition to interest in target practice and hunting and that sort of things. Uh, firearms have taken on a kind of uh, mystique in the United States, which is not, fortunately, which is not shared <clears throat> in many other countries. In many other countries, hanging and poisoning are much more likely uh, than gun uh, than gunshot. Now, <clears throat> I want to say a little bit about trends that have been going on uh, around the world, and they have. Uh, th these are some uh, recent data from several uh, countries, and you'll see that many parts of the world have shown or have found lower rates of suicide in more recent years than a decade or two decades ago. This is true in uh, in many European countries, uh, in uh, China, in Russia, in, Jap in Japan. It stayed more or less the, sta the same. Uh, the United States is an outlier. And in the United States, the suicide rate has actually been rising for at least the past 10 to 20 years with uh, some good news that I saw uh, just recently in the latest uh, federal data showing a small decrease in 2019 data for the first time uh, in two decades. Uh, I hope that that trend will continue, but uh, in general for the past decade or so, uh, rates uh, in the United States have been rising steadily every year. And in this slide on the left, you can see what's been happening since the early 2000s. And I can tell you that that number in 18, uh, 2018 uh, went above 14, uh, and in 2019, it came down uh, about a half of a unit of measurement. And the <clears throat> unit of measurement here is the uh, measurement that epidemiologists like to use. It's cases per 100,000 population uh, per year. So again, these are general population data. <clears throat> now, the, the data on the right-hand side of this slide uh, you need to, to uh, uh, take uh, rather cautiously. Um, they compare uh, what was going on uh, some time ago with what's been happening recently, and you'll see that uh, most of the uh, uh, recent data are larger uh, than, uh, than in, uh, a decade ago. Uh, generally, uh, for the, for the uh, most of the population, uh, risks, as I said before, for suicide higher in men than in women. Uh, if this is something that may be uh, true uh, even in juvenile patients, uh, whereas the racial differences seem to shift with age. For example, in general in our population, uh, African-American uh, persons have a much lower risk than uh, uh, white uh, Caucasian persons, and uh, similar or a little lower even than in uh, Hispanic uh, people. <clears throat> in our country and in many other countries, uh, 
uh, native uh, 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 populations, uh, Indians, Eskimos, and so on, have very, very high rates. Uh, this probably has a lot to do with uh, disruption of their uh, of their cultures, particularly by invasion of uh, European immigrants over the past several centuries. But uh, this pattern uh, we found uh, recently holds up in uh, Canada as well as in the uh, United States. Now, very recently, there have been several studies that have come out from the U.S. arguing that the uh, low risk among Black uh, African American uh, persons may vary with age considerably. That that is, that in young adolescents, the risk in Blacks may be slightly greater than among whites, but that's only for very, very young adolescents and uh, pre-pubertal uh, uh, latency age to kids. So th again, this is a, is a complex uh, story. It changes from time to time, but some generalizations seem to hold up. These are some data that I think are particularly uh, provocative because they show that even though generally, at least in the United States, risks in rural areas are much higher than in urban areas. The rates have been rising uh, in uh, urban, suburban, small town, uh, and rural areas steadily over the past decade or so. And similarly, among age groups, even though uh, risks differ by age enormously, and among kids, uh, the older adolescents are at much higher risk for suicidal uh, uh, risk than uh, prepubertal children or young adolescents. But in all of these groups, the trends have been toward increases uh, over time. Um, I've already commented on this. I think I'll keep moving ahead. This is a very uh, interesting uh, kind of presentation. And it's it's it, when I first saw data like this, I was really quite shocked because my naive expectation was that I would see more suicide along the East Coast and the West Coast and lower risks uh, in the middle of the country. Um, and it's probably not true as a generalization. Our highest risks come in the far West, Southwest, inner mountain states, uh, and in Alaska. Uh, rates in Alaska are much higher than in the ma mainland uh, United States, and certainly among uh, native Alaskans, uh, the Inuit uh, population and Indian populations, the rates are sky high. Again, uh, probably as a reflection of the disruption of their cultures in, in the last uh, century or two. Um, so the generalization seems to be that uh, rurality uh, or being away from the city seems to be an area of higher risk. And we've seen that pattern in other countries as well. And I'll show you some data about that. However, <clears throat> I wanted to remind us again that this story becomes enormously complicated. I just recently saw some data among uh, African-American uh, patients and it turns out that their risk in rural areas is actually lower than it is in cities. And I think among African-Americans, uh, city life and, and urban stresses and uh, other factors that I think are quite well known uh, probably uh, contribute to this kind of difference. But as a generalization, um, the less uh, densely populated areas seem to have higher risk. These are some new data I just put together a couple of weeks ago when I was doing some teaching in Canada showing you the same trend that if you go to less populated parts of Canada, uh, the suicide risk goes way up. And then finally, this is a uh, new uh, set of data that we gathered uh, in Dr. Tondo's research uh, uh, clinic in uh, Sardinia. And uh, I draw your, there are a number of factors here that are not surprising. Uh, I'll say more about risk factors in a moment. But this con contrast of rural versus urban risk uh, being 50% higher in uh, underpopulated parts of Sardinia is again, a, a uh, supports this general uh, pattern of higher risk with lower population. These are also uh, interesting uh, data that have to do uh, 
uh, I think in part with the population density uh, phenomenon. These are data that came uh, uh, interestingly from Dr. Tondo's uh, Master of Public Health uh, thesis that he did uh, at Harvard about a decade ago. And there's some very interesting findings. These are data based on statewide suicide rates um, and looking at various factors uh, that differ markedly among states in the U.S. And one of the uh, uh, striking uh, findings at the top of this chart is that population density, the lower it is, the higher the risk uh, of suicide. Uh, higher among men, uh, low, uh, high, very high among uh, uh, Native Americans, much lower among African Americans. And these are all uh, factors thrown in more or less to test the uh, methods, and they seem to fulfill expectations uh, from other studies. So it uh, supports the idea that the methods that uh, Dr. Tonda was using are, are credible. Uh, the interesting thing is, though, in addition to the population density, the density of physicians, the density of psychiatrists, uh, the density of family income per year uh, are all inversely connected uh, with suicide. So the, the speculation is that among other factors, probably including uh, uh, access to guns and other, and other factors, poverty and so on, uh, alcohol, many other things, uh, the, the population density also correlates with the availability or access to care, uh, support, uh, clinical interventions, and so on. And I think that's uh, one, one of the uh, very uh, important public health views of suicide risk and things that might be done to reduce suicide risk. Uh, that, that is paying more attention to areas of uh, high risk uh, in, in remote uh, underpopulated areas, bringing uh, resources and, and supportive services to those areas probably will uh, make some differences. Now, among uh, other uh, risk factors, probably number one on most uh, lists that I've seen uh, would include previous attempt. Uh, now, many, many people uh, attempt uh, once or twice and may not do it again, uh, but some people having attempted once uh, may try again, and this is a very strong predictor of uh, eventual fatality. Now, there are, there are other subgroups among attempters who are more complicated. There are people who actually seem to derive benefit from uh, self-injury. Uh, these are usually people with personality disorders, uh, not with major psychiatric illnesses, uh, where the, the uh, cutting or, or doing other self-abusing behavior seems to have an effect of reducing uh, distress and discomfort. Uh, but that's a, a whole separate topic that uh, we don't have time to get into today. Generally speaking, attempt uh, is a, an ominous and important risk factor. Major mood disorder is another one. Uh, abusive drugs, particularly uh, uh, poly abuse or, or abuse of multiple substances, um, is, a, is a very big risk factor. There are all sorts of psychological and social uh, events, losses, deaths, uh, shame, uh, poverty, ma many other uh, uh, psychosocial factors are uh, important. Social isolation is an important one, and uh, it's uh, very well known that elderly uh, widowed men uh, have much higher risk than in younger men or married men, for example. Lack of access to clinical care, I've already mentioned. Uh, easy access to methods of suicide, particularly firearms, poisons, uh, overdoses or prescribed medicines. All these are risk factors to be uh, attended to. And then one that's become uh, noticeable recently, and I'll show you some of our data on this topic. Um, people who've been psychiatrically hospitalized have a very high risk of suicidal behavior soon after discharge. This is a, another complicated topic, and I've, let, let me save it until I show you some 
data that go along with it. Now, this is a, a very, to me, a very uh, distressing set of data. It's a uh, summary of literature, uh, basically a review of world literature, led by a trainee in, in Rome, Alberto Forte, uh, that we put together a few years ago. And it shows you uh, large clinical co cohorts followed over long periods of time. Um, these are people who have been ill for an average of nine and a half years. And it shows you risk of, uh, of long-term morbidity. This is not about suicide. This is about uh, illness. And these are mood disordered patients. So you'd expect to see a lot of depression. And we certainly see that. The shocking thing to me is the, are the green bars, which show you total morbidity uh, over time. And the shocking finding is that among bipolar and unipolar patients, they are clinically unwell 45 plus percent of the time. These are clinically treated people uh, meeting uh, what would what I think be accepted as community standards for treatment. And even so, they are unwell 45 or more percent of the time. That's shocking. Now, in the unipolar patients, it's all about depression. But also in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 patients, or bipolar patients overall, the blue bars indicate that, again, it's mostly about depression, depression, depression. The red bars indicate that we're doing a pretty good job against uh, mania, and particularly hypomania. But uh, the blue bars are uh, an enormous ongoing problem, and they account for fully three quarters of the unresolved total morbidity. So I think the, the, uh, the short point I'm making here is that bipolar depression, for me, has become uh, an enormously pressing problem. Uh, it's not easy to diagnose. Uh, how best to treat it continues to be rather controversial and, and uh, argued about. And I have actually uh, elevated bipolar depression to my uh, hit list of number one uh, public enemy that we need to uh, do more to understand and to help. Now, these are, are really very, very ominous findings from uh, another uh, review done with uh, Dr. Forte in, in Rome. And we went through the world's literature on post-psychiatric hospital risk of suicidal uh, suicide attempts and actual suicides. And what you find, if you consider the, the risk on a per uh, exposure time or, or percent of events per month, it's enormous in the first one or two months, and then it drops precipitously, and by six to 12 months, it's uh, uh, much, much lower. This is a very sensitive bit of information. Even though the data have been collected all over the world, I have a particular concern about what we are doing or not doing in the States. And, and I think that what this is telling me is that we are not doing a good job of planning for aftercare uh, for patients who have been hospitalized. I, I think that in, in the States, there's been a, uh, well, there are a couple of problems. One, one is it's not easy to get into a psychiatric hospital. And many of the people who get in uh, is basically because of dangerousness not necessarily because of severity of illness. So people who are uh, out of control, can't take care of themselves, are socially very disruptive, and particularly people who are suicidal or, God forbid, homicidal, uh, are much more likely to get admitted. So this is a particularly high-risk group for suicide anyway. And if you, if you don't have a very, very well organized plan for aftercare, have it set up ideally even before the discharge and have it ready to go uh, the minute uh, after the patient leaves the hospital, then you're running a very high risk. And this, uh, the, these data show you that uh, the risk within the first month or two uh, is enormously uh, high. And I think these are risks that we could do more to uh, reduce. 
uh, it's going to take a different uh, mentality about how we organize services and how we support them financially. But uh, I think, at least in theory, we could be doing a lot better. Now, I think before I run out of time, I want to say a few things about therapeutics. And uh, uh, my bias is toward uh, medically oriented therapeutics. And I acknowledge that there has been a good deal of research in recent years on various forms of psychotherapy to try to reduce suicidal risk. Uh, as I read that literature, a lot of it has come out of the uh, uh, treatment of persons with non-psychotic disorders, but particularly uh, personality disorders, uh, borderline personality, uh, other neurotic conditions, where the psychotherapies seem to have uh, demonstrable utility, uh, even including uh, reasonably scientifically well-designed trials that uh, look uh, quite encouraging. Uh, what about uh, more uh, medical uh, types of treatments? I wanted to show you here a uh, quote from a London physician, uh, not in the uh, uh, recent history, but this is eight, in the 1820s. Uh, Dr. Burroughs said that uh, medical treatments uh, for suicide could be uh, considered similar to those that are applicable in ordinary cases of insanity. Uh, this is a remarkably prescient uh, insight and prediction of the future. Uh, I think in his time, uh, the bad news, there really wasn't much to consider for therapeutics because there, there really wasn't much to be done except to try to protect people or to put them in a safe place and uh, watch them and try to support them. But there really were no uh, treatments to speak of. And so it's, this was a, a kind of a theoretical idea. Um, the first treatment of any treatment in the world, uh, medicine, psychotherapy, anything, ECT, the very first treatment that ever got regulatory recognition as being effective was the antipsychotic drug clozapine and only in schizophrenia patients. Uh, this uh, work goes back to the uh, uh, important study that was led by Herb Meltzer uh, in the States uh, in 2003, uh, where they did a randomized comparison of suicidal behaviors among schizophrenia patients randomized to treatment for at least a year <clears throat> with either clozapine or olanzapine. And uh, as it turned out, clozapine looked better. Now, mind you, there were very few actual suicides and if you look critically at the raw data, there were actually uh, a few more suicides with clozapine than with uh, olanzapine, but the numbers are so small that I think they don't mean anything. But if you consider interventions aimed at preventing suicide or need to hospitalize someone because of emerging apparent suicidal risk, those kinds of uh, outcomes were strongly uh, favoring um, uh, clozapine. Now, recently, yet a third review uh, led by Dr. Forte uh, with me from uh, Rome. <clears throat> and this is a study that is about to appear in the uh, British uh, Journal of Psychopharmacology uh, momentarily. We went through the available world's literature on clozapine, and uh, that's on the right. And this supports the uh, what I've just said, the clozapine overall uh, reduced uh, risk considerably uh, and highly uh, significantly. If we look at data on all other modern antipsychotic drugs, olanzapine, eripiprazole, cotiapine, uh, eripip, you know, whatever, whatever drugs you want to consider, uh, there's nothing apparently going on. Uh, and the bottom line is that the uh, odds ratio combined by meta analytic analysis uh, it, it runs above 0.9, which means that uh, there's a trivial difference favoring uh, drug against no drug, uh, but it's far, far from significant. So it looks as if clozapine is something special. Uh, again, not a surprise. And I think the clinical view about clozapine is while it's tricky and potentially toxic and dangerous in many ways, it still is a very special 
medicine clinically and probably does things uh, uh, in the treatment of psychotic illness that no other drug uh, has ever been able to do. The big problem with clozapine for me right now is it needs to be studied more broadly. Uh, we have good data for schizophrenia. Uh, clozapine is sometimes used, uh, particularly in bipolar disorder, uh, in cases not responding well to other uh, treatments. But uh, we really need to broaden uh, efforts to look at uh, clozapine in other conditions. And I would think uh, bipolar disorder would be a very plausible target. These are data that uh, I started collecting uh, about a decade ago, uh, again with uh, Professor Tondo from Sardinia. And this is a review of the world's literature on uh, risk of life-threatening suicidal behaviors, attempts, or suicides um, in persons treated with lithium. Most of these are bipolar disorder patients or people that would uh, be probably considered Kreplinian manic depressive people broadly defined, people with recurrent major mood disorders. And if you put all the data together on risks for suicidal uh, events with and without lithium in a mostly bipolar uh, group of patients, uh, if you put all the data together, you get this uh, uh, risk ratio of four plus which means a fourfold reduction of risk, highly significant. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you a, a brief story out of school. When we first saw data like this, it was one time in my life when I became really uh, a little too full of myself. And I thought, this is one time when I'm going to dare send a manuscript to the By God New England Journal of Medicine where psychiatrists usually fear to tread. And we sent the paper to the uh, New England Journal. And a month or so later, we got reviews back. And the reviews were, were fairly benign. There, there really were no uh, lethal technical uh, criticisms. But the, the overall reaction was, why, why should we be interested in this? Who cares? What's this got to do with medicine? Uh, suicide is some kind of a social problem. It's not a medical problem. And, you know, get out of here. So we uh, were, were kind of shocked by that response. And we thought, well, let's try number two. So we sent the uh, manuscript to JAMA, which is probably arguably the second best uh, or most highly respected medical journal in the country. And uh, same reaction got her reviews back and it was kind of a big yawn. Why, why should we be interested in this? Well, the thing that was shocking to us, this is a fourfold reduction of risk. This is a dramatic effect. <clears throat> if we had sent a paper to the New England Journal saying that we reduced risk of cancer, uh, heart attack by five or 10%, that would have been above the fold in the New York Times the next day. But this was somehow received with a very strange sociological set of attitudes about psychiatry, about suicide, that it's something other than from general medicine. And again, I, I, I know I'm becoming a little preachy about this, but it bothers me. And I think that this, I hope that this kind of attitude doesn't obtain in other parts of the world. And indeed, we sent the data to a leading European journal uh, back a decade ago, and they uh, accepted it immediately and saw the importance of it. Anyway, um, we tried very hard. Uh, Fred Goodwin and I prepared what's called a, a, a citizen's petition to uh, the FDA uh, soon after this paper was published. And we cited the, uh, all this evidence to the FDA and said, would you consider recognizing lithium as being worthy of a, of a recognition for possibly having a beneficial effect on suicide risk? And the FDA, uh, re and we said there are uh, at least a half a dozen of the uh, trials that are prospective, randomized, and placebo-controlled where lithium was significant. 
and they went for some months. Finally, got the reviews back from the F from the FDA, and they said essentially, uh, nice try, but we're not going to buy it. And the reason was that most of these studies had to do with suicidal behavior as an incidental finding. That is, the studies were not designed to test for suicide as the outcome. And to that, I can only say good luck, because who is going to have the uh, uh, courage to design a study, uh, let's say, against placebo, where the outcome is fatality? I mean, it's just not going to happen. Anyway, we, we have pursued this question, and very recently, we, uh, Tondo and I uh, uh, have an, a, an editorial in the uh, JAMA Psychiatry uh, Journal, and we put together these data from a modest number of randomized controlled trials. Uh, the most recent one is the bottom uh, study by Katz, a uh, big VA study that was published last month in the uh, in, in JAMA Psychiatry, and that was a, a study deliberately designed with suicidal outcomes as the defined outcome. All these other studies, the suicidal outcomes are incidental. That is, they were uh, by luck comments uh, about adverse effect outcomes. Whatever they are, they were randomized, they were double blind, they were uh, placebo controlled, and there's a huge impact of lithium against placebo. These are fatalities. These are actually and, and attempts, uh, but uh, se severe suicidal behaviors. And the uh, overall uh, difference is uh, substantial and highly significant statistically. So I think I'm about out of time, and I think I'm going to quit at that point and uh, again make the uh, point that uh, if there is something to this notion that there may be a biomedical therapeutics that might be pertinent for uh, suicide, uh, I think at this point it's still quite preliminary. And other than data with, with uh, clozapine and psychotic illness and lithium and bipolar disorder, possibly in uh, some cases of unipolar depression, um, and with some recent uh, experimental uh, treatments uh, that are being used in depression that may have uh, effects on suicidal, uh, at least thought, not so much uh, behavior at this point. I think there's something brewing there, and I, I think it's an area that deserves further study. And I think uh, a decade ago, most people would have dismissed this as being uh, hopelessly uh, optimistic. I think it's something worth worth looking at. Again, the main points that I've made is to repeat them, uh, the point major mental illnesses can be fatal, uh, suicide usually in younger people, and responses to general medical illnesses in older patients, uh, and the numbers of dead persons at the end of the year are similar uh, from both kinds of causes. Uh, suicide risks have been declining in many countries, have been rising for the past decade or two in the U.S., although very recent data from 2019 suggests that the risk may be leveling off or even slightly uh, declining. Suicide risk by diagnosis is very high in bipolar disorder, both type 1 and type 2 also high in uh, substance abuse, especially uh, poly abuse. Uh, we have proposed this ratio of attempts to suicide uh, as a measure of uh, lethality of suicidal behaviors. It averages about 30 or 40 in the general population below 10 uh, and as low as five in bipolar disorder. Uh, of, that is five attempts for every suicide. Uh, therapeutic interventions, again, can increase the AS ratio, that is, decrease apparent lethality. We've shown that with uh, lithium in the past. Risk factors, uh, we know uh, a little bit about uh, th these kinds of risk factors, prior attempt, substance abuse, major mood disorder, and so on and so on. The problem is that all these risk factors hold up nicely for 
population samples, and they are strong statistically, but from a clinical perspective, they have limited utility. We use them. I mean, they're part of everyday sound clinical practice, but uh, the ability to predict who's going to do it and when they're going to do it or how they're going to do it, that's tough. And that's really a clinical challenge and requires us to rely on all the things that we've learned over the past century that uh, make uh, psychiatry such a challenging uh, profession. Uh, medical treatments, we, we've talked about, I think, enough, and I'm going to quit at that point. And if, if there's a question or two, uh, let's uh, see if we can deal with those. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Baldessarini. Always um, very much to the forefront of uh, data. And um, there is uh, always this excitement of your, uh, during your lectures of producing new data. Uh, and we're all very, very thankful for this. Um, we have some questions um, and uh, I'm going to take them uh, as they have come in. Um, from Dr. Hassanig, uh, personally, I am very reluctant to prescribe antidepressants to young, especially male, depressed quote unquote patients, something that I call a parent first episode or major, of major depression. Often they are without clear history of hypomanic manic mixed episodes, deny familial history of bipolar disorder. However, I'm cautious. Am I wrong? I think you're very right. And I certainly uh, would say amen to everything that you've said. <clears throat> I think one of the great challenges and, and one of the things that we're spending a lot of time in our current research is to try to improve early diagnosis and recognition of bipolar disorder as distinct uh, from unipolar major depressive disorder. This is a very, very difficult challenge uh, in children and adolescents. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Tsipakis and I know this very well from having reviewed that literature some time ago together. Um, I, I think that the, the big fear that many people have, there, there are several bases for the uneasiness. One is that I think the status of conceptualization uh, and diagnostic criteria for major mood disorders in children remains a little early and a little imperfect and a little insecure, I would say. That's a, a rather generous comment. Um, it, it's actually tough. And to be able to recognize bipolar disorder in kids is really difficult. And a lot of the phenomena that go with early onset mood disorders overlap with those that go with bipolar disorder. That is, if you have early onset in adolescence, for example, uh, or even earlier, and you have multiple episodes, these are things that happen commonly in kids, but there are also criteria that make you think about bipolar disorder. Uh, how do you sort the two out? This is one of the great challenges of uh, all the clinical skills that we have. Uh, you have to dig in deeply into the uh, past history. You have to talk not only with the patient, but with people who know the patient really well. Uh, the idea of getting somebody to recognize, for example, hypomanic episodes, uh, very difficult. Many, many patients are shocked when you raise the possibility that they've ever been hypomanic. And their response is, what do you mean? Why are you psychopathologizing me, my good moods? That's me at my best. Uh, that's not a sickness. And, and th there's a terrible prejudice uh, about recognizing hypomania in particular. But I think early onset, multiple episodes, uh, certainly mixed features, psychotic features, family history is, is important, all these things help you with early diagnosis. But even then, I agree with your position that if you're going to treat with an antidepressant in a, in a young person, be very, very careful. And I think that the good news about it is that while switching into hypomania or mania or psychosis occurs in uh, young people starting with an antidepressant, 
it's not like a thunderbolt coming out of a blue sky. These are things that you can see coming. So if you know the patient well, if you follow them closely, uh, whether you know in person or by telephone or however you're doing it, especially in the beginning of the treatment trial, you can see it coming. You will see sleeplessness, uh, agitation, irritability. Call uh, I'm sorry, uh, that you can see the thing coming, you can do something about it. And the first thing to do about it is to back off on the antidepressant and maybe uh, add in something that's a little more soothing, uh, sedative and antipsychotic, lithium, what, whatever seems to be appropriate. But I, I agree with you, this is a very risky, challenging clinical problem. Thank you, Dr. Baldessarini. I'm moving on to um, a couple more questions. Dr. Chetri, um, is the high risk for suicide post-discharge for all psychiatric cases? What could be the possible reasons for the high risk? This is asking about post-hospital suicide. Discharge, only. yeah. I, I think this is very, very painful for me to talk about because it, it really gets into airing uh, dirty linen in public and it may be largely uh, a, a U.S. problem, I don't know. I mean, our systems for caring for psychiatric patients are, are really leave a lot to be desired. The funding and support for psychiatric services is poor. Um, I think the ability to get people into hospital take care of them and then to provide for aftercare are all less than what one would like to see. And I think I think it's not so much in the descriptors of the clinical problem that you need to worry about or about people signing out against advice and putting themselves at risk because they really want to die. That Yeah, that happens sometimes. I think it's uncommon. What I think is going on is that we're sending people out the back door who are still sick. And we've done some studies uh, over the past year showing that as lengths of stay were cranked down by administrative fiat back in the 1990s, we saw our length of stay in our hospital drop from an average of six, seven, eight weeks down to one or two weeks. And the rate of rehospitalization or major breakdown after discharge, they went through the ceiling. And the, uh, I think that the problem is that, w and, we, and we documented that people were being sent out still quite symptomatic, certainly much more than they had been in the earlier days when lengths of stay were longer. There's so much pressure, at least in the States, to get people out of the hospital that I think we're sending a lot of people who are barely beginning to get better, barely recovering, and are still very unstable, quite symptomatic. And I think they're at high risk. I think that it's as simple as that. So this is why I say I think doing a better job at organizing uh, a structured, dependable, uh, maybe actually try it out before the patient leaves type of aftercare is really important. I think it can save lives. Thank you. And one last question, is there any role of clozapine in chronically suicidal patients, especially for those with personality disorders? With You're asking about clozapine? Clozapine in chronically suicidal patients, and especially for those with personality oh, disorders. I, I think the academic answer to that is only if the diagnosis is schizophrenia. I mean, I wish it were true across the board, but the, these are studies that have yet to be done. And I, I really encourage uh, more work to be done, especially about suicide in people with mood disorders, particularly bi bipolar patients, where I think uh, uh, clozapine uh, probably has some utility. Again, this is tough work. Uh, doing anything to test for anti-suicide effects is extremely dangerous, risky. Uh, raises liability concerns and legal risks and so on. Uh, it's very, very hard to do. And with clozapine as the test agent, it's doubly difficult because clozapine, as wonderful as it can be, uh, is a potentially very difficult drug. Thank you, Dr. Baldessarini. 
lots of bad side effects. Uh, ileus, uh, cardiac arrhythmias, uh, there's the, the whole uh, uh, leukocyte suppression and, and, and sepsis, and there are many, many life-threatening risks that make it uh, doubly hard to do. But, uh, you know, it's being used for schizophrenia, so I think it might be uh, nice to have some data in, in other disorders. Enough for one day. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, we could uh, make a short, uh, a short comment to myself and uh, Peter. Peter, are you with us? Okay, I will I will start and then Peter yeah. might 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 join. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Battesarini, thank you, thank you so much for your uh, interesting uh, speech. I myself love maps, and the map of the U.S. Uh, I have I have just published a paper on uh, on the suicidality in the U.S. Uh, in the first uh, half of the 20th century until the Second World War. And we have also worked on maps of the U.S. and maps of Europe. And in, in, in the U.S., it's, it's impressive that the Rocky Mountains split the country into yeah. two. Yeah. And how, how a lot of factors, including uh, population density, race, economic condition, the Appalachian, uh, the Appalachian uh, states are very poor and problematic. Uh, and also the terrain uh, determines what race uh, occupies the terrain. For example, the southern states have a lot of Hispanics. The Great Plains have only Anglo-Saxons, white people, and the big cities have uh, African Americans. And the European descendants in the U.S. have similar suicidal rates than in in uh, continental Europe. So it's 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 very interesting how all these uh, factors uh, interplay in the in the U.S. and also climate. If you see the climate map of the US, it has uh, a lot of similarities with the, uh, with the suicidal map. And the same holds for Europe. For Europe, uh, the gradient of suicidality is from south to northeast. It's not right. south, to, it's south to northeast. Right. I don't want to take much time. I just have a final comment on the question, on the last question, what we do with with personality disorder patients with borderline personality, which are chronically suicidal. Now, the big question here is, is this a personality disorder? Because this, this answers the question why the New England and other journals have this kind of behavior and attitude towards psychiatry, because we are very much inclined towards psychosocial interpretations yeah. of even of lethal of very very serious conditions so if this my my answer would be that lithium might be useful in this case because it's probably some kind of sub threshold uh, mood disorder if not uh, a real uh, mood disorder could i comment I, I see uh, lithium being used empirically more and more broadly these days, uh, but I don't see papers. You know, people are not doing studies uh, aside from bipolar patients uh, to look for uh, lithium effects in borderline disorder and, and other conditions. And I, I think it's another area that there's an opportunity to, to uh, do some work. Maybe you so. Know, you, you know, one problem with the trials in, in the meta analysis you showed, the biggest problem is that individual trials were negative. Yes, the meta analysis was positive, yeah. but yeah. individual trials were negative. And this is one of the major reasons why the FDA didn't want to approve an extra labeling of, for lithium. Uh, so, uh, and who's going to pay for these studies? Nobody will pay. There are no grants for this kind. Well, that's been the problem with lithium from the beginning. It's always been a poor orphan drug. No patent, no commercial interest. Yeah. Peter. Well, uh, yes. Well, for me, it was uh, extremely interesting paper, and uh, 
I remember I, I, I know Dr. Baldessarini for about 50 years, I think, 40 at least. We met in, in Florence, I think, during the, the Congress. And at that time, I remember we talked about one WHO study in which I participated. Uh, I remember that that time it was multicentric study and Hungarian uh, participants show us the highest level of uh, suicidality rate in, in, in their country comparatively to some others. And what is interesting, they do themselves uh, quite an interesting comparative study within Europe and show that the suicidal rate is linked uh, not uh, with climate, but the latitude of the, of the place. And it was uh, Zoltan, Zoltan remember it probably, I think it'll be a good bridge to pass uh, the, the floor to him because uh, Hungary is always in, the, uh, in this um, uh, serious interest to, to, to do the problem of suicidality. Coming back to uh, Austro-Hungarian uh, empire in which generally speaking within this yeah, border, the, the rates of suicidality was very high in Europe. But uh, for me, it was interesting you know, this factor of, uh, of uh, latitude, which is, uh, I don't know, it was confirmed later or not. But frankly speaking, in general, I was very uh, impressed by the comparative assessment of different countries, because for me, it's also an enigma why, for instance, in Russia, such decrease in the last 10 years. I asked sometimes Norman Sartorius about, and he told me that it is general tendency and nobody knows even why, because for instance, in one region in Russia, so-called Astrakhan, it's in, down in the um, bank of the Volga River, the level of citadality is simply zero, which is, uh, you know, it's very difficult. And my question was, uh, if there are any relationship between the level of lithium in the, in the water uh, of the Caspian Sea and the Volga River to this uh, level. I don't know, there are many speculation, many different hypotheses, but uh, this overview was very spectacular, very interesting. Can stimulate our brain activity for a long period. Thank you, Dr. Balasarini. I always follow your papers. Thank you. Could I, ask, could I ask one question? Do you know how solid the data are about latitude in the Southern Hemisphere? Does it work in the Southern Hemisphere as clearly? I'm, I'm so, sorry. The same, the, same. The, the relationship of suicide rate and uh, 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 latitude in southern hemisphere is the same. The more close is in the country to the equator, the lower is the suicide rate. Yeah, that's my impression. I, I just didn't know exactly. how, how good the data were. Yeah, good. Uh, the problem with the southern hemisphere is that uh, most of land area is in the north hemisphere. Yeah. And the north hemisphere has um, has a different shape of land mass, which, which permits a different ecosystem. Africa is vertical, while Eurasia is uh, horizontal, and also the Americas is. Uh, so Perfect. this, this yeah. makes comparisons impossible. Yeah. But the climate is uh, important. Uh, it's not temperature. It's it's uh, it's probably uh, the no 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 how rapid how how fast temperature changes from spring to summer and from yeah. summer to uh, to to winter and uh, for example in Greece it has four four changing points in other countries it has only two. This is why it's so difficult to, 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 to clarify things. In, in the US, there are five different climate zones, climate areas. And the most, the most interesting thing in my eyes was that California, which is the only uh, 
the only area outside the Mediterranean who has a Mediterranean type climate has so low, uh, as, as, as low suicidal rate as it is in the, in the uh, Mediterranean area. It's, it's interesting, but also there are many Hispanic people there. <laughs> so this could be a bias. One of the great ironies in this geography is, do you know where the some of the highest suicide rates are? I'm sorry. In Alaska. Lowest. In Al no, the lowest low in New Jersey. DC. DC. Washington, DC, very low. And I, I would have thought Washington would be one of the highest because it's oh. such a stressful place. But... And New York City state. Yeah. Something like six. It's similar to Greece and Italy. It's, yes. it's impressive, the, the, the difference. So, da Daria? Well, off to Daria Smirnova now, Professor Smirnova. Thank, Thank you, Ross, you. again. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much for lecture, for amazing discussion, very interesting discussion. And now I move to the introduction of our second speaker, uh, Professor Zoltan Rimer. Dr. Rimer is a professor of psychiatry um, at the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy and scientific uh, director at the Department of Clinical and Theoretical Mental Health in the Zemmelweis University in Hungary, and also a director of the Laboratory for Suicide Research and Prevention in the National Institute of Psychiatry and Addictions in Budapest, Hungary. Professor Rimer has three special qualifications in psychiatry, in neurology, and clinical pharmacology, and he received his PhD by Hungarian um, Academy of Sciences in 1993 and his uh, Doctor of Sciences degree in uh, 2004. Uh, his special interest is uh, clinical and biological aspects of mood and anxiety disorders with particular regards to prediction of treatment response and prevention of suicide. And an additional interest of Professor Zoltan Riemer uh, is the interface of mood and cardiovascular disorders. Uh, Professor Rimmer has published more than 450 papers and his uh, cumulative uh, impact factor uh, is above uh, 500 and the number of independent citations exceeded uh, uh, several thousands. And what is important also that uh, Professor Rimmer received numerous awards and an award of the Department of Child and Adults and Psychiatry by Columbia University, New York, and also uh, award uh, of the Hemingway Foundation, and also the award, Lifetime Achievement Award of the, of course, Hungarian Psychiatric Association he serves, and um, the Aristotle Gold Medal of Lifetime Achievement in Mental Health given by the International Society of Neurobiology and Psychopharmacology. Uh, Professor Riemann, uh, Riemer um, is a member of several um, association and the executive uh, committee um, and the boards of uh, national and international associations, including uh, European Psychiatric Association and European College of Neuropsychopharmacology, and also um, editorial board member of influential uh, peer reviewed journals such as Journal of Affective Disorders and International Journal of uh, Psychiatry and Clin Clinical uh, Practice and World Journal of Biological Psychiatry. There is an interesting uh, paper published about Professor Zoltan. Uh, Reamer in Psychiatric Bulletin by Cambridge uh, University Press. And there was a question which uh, Dominic Fennan asked Professor Reamer, how would you like to be remembered? And uh, Professor Reamer said, um, I would like to be remembered as a man who did something good for his family, uh, his patients and colleagues, and uh, who will live uh, till the age of 100 with good mental health. <laughs> And I think this is really a great example of the desire for life and really anti-suicidal behavior, which is, you know, very important for today's um, uh, topic. And uh, um, Professor Riemer 
also visited Russia many times and we listened to his lectures also at Susdal Early Career Psychiatry School. So now Professor Rimer generous to share his knowledge with uh, Greek and international psychiatrists at this uh, Master of Sciences in Clinical Mental Health webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, and we are uh, um, happy uh, to collaborate with your good colleague, Professor Xenia Gonda. Um, and uh, Zimmerweis University with, uh, within different uh, studies. So Professor um, Zoltan Rimer will uh, uh, talk about social and environmental variables in suicidality as a phenomena. So the floor is yours, Professor Zoltan Rimer. Thank you. Good afternoon or good evening, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the very nice, kind introduction of you. Uh, I have been really several times in, in Russia, in Suzdal, and I have learned also Russian in the primary and secondary school. But my lecture is today on the social and environmental factors in suicidality. Many, many thanks for the kind invitation of Professor Javed and Professor Funtulakis. He gave me a very good topic uh, because I, I have been mainly recognized as a biological psychiatrist in, in quotation marks, but, but I am clinical psychiatrist. I am full-time clinical psychiatrist who, whose uh, main interest mood and, uh, and anxiety disorder, suicide, uh, and, uh, and uh, relationship between mood, anxiety disorder, and cardiovascular disorder, and so on, and so on. Very heavy topic, very, very big topic, social and environmental factors in suicide. Uh, practically nothing to declare regarding to this lecture and uh, a very very big topic and, and it was very difficult for me to to choose the most appropriate slides uh, we know that suicide is a very complex multi-causal human phenomenon involving several psychiatric medical psychosocial cultural and demographic risk factors, both on individual and both on ecological level. And uh, uh, in spite of the fact that about 90% of suicide victims have at least one major mental disorder at the time of suicide, mostly untreated and most frequently major depressive episode, mainly bipolar, bipolar one or bipolar two, unipolar major depression, substance use disorder and schizophrenia. It means 90% of the victims have current, uh, uh, mostly untreated disorder, psychiatric disorder at the time of suicide. But from the other hand, the majority of suicide victims <laughs> are, are uh, untreated and major mental disorders is necessary, but not sufficient condition for suicidal behavior because the majority of psychiatric patients never commit. And uh, also the majority of psychiatric patients never attempt suicide. And this way, beside the major mental disorders, uh, other factors plays also a very important role, like special clinical characteristics, depression, bipolarity, agitation, mixed depression, insomnia, hopelessness, comorbidity, mostly substance use uh, comorbidity and anxiety disorder comorbidity, genetic uh, familiar factors, including family history of uh, psychiatric disorder, family history of suicide, and uh, early uh, adverse life events and, and some uh, family and negative uh, life events and stressors personality or temperamental factors, very important, impulsivity, aggressivity, 
affective temperaments because there are a lot of studies indicating that hypertimic hyperthymic temperament is, is protective but depressive uh, cyclotimic particularly cyclotimic or irritable temperaments are uh, risk factors for suicide if persons showing this temperament profile became depressed or, or uh, mixed demographic factors very well known that males and old people are more vulnerable for suicide psychosocial factors and environmental factors the two two main focus of my lecture and of course cultural factors plays very important role which are the most important uh, psychosocial, psychological factors, social factors, which related to suicidal behavior, unemployment, low income, access to health care, insurance, separation, divorce, isolation, life events, religiosity, spirit, uh, spirituality. And it's very important to note that they are interrelated. Unemployment, low income, the studies have clearly shown a significant relationship between unemployment or, or low income or, or uh, uh, bad financial situation in between uh, and uh, suicidal behavior in individual level and also on the level of general population. This is a very frequently quoted paper from The Lancet. Uh, the showing that this meta-analysis shows that one percent rise in unemployment it results in about 0.8 percent rise in suicide rates. Uh, this is also true for individual level. We, we published several years ago a case control suicide study, almost 200 suicide cases and uh, the same number of controls. And we have found that the rate of unemployment among suicide cases in, in, in 2001, when we, we performed this study, was 17%. And the same rate in control population was 3%. And the same rate in the general population of Hungary that year was, was almost 6%. It is also important. Uh, another studies, a big meta-analysis shows in 54 countries that after the 2008 economic crisis, the rate of suicide uh, uh, mortality increased in Europe and, and in American countries, particularly in males, among males, and among areas, among countries, among regions with higher level of job loss. Another important study from UK, uh, Professor Keith Houghton published this paper and he, he have found that increased rate of self-harm were found, found in areas where there were the greater increase in the rates of unemployment. Uh, the, the strong relationship between unemployment and suicide mortality is also present in Hungary. Uh, we have published this, this small study in Lancet several years ago, but we have found that the, the declining, the sharply declining suicide mortality of Hungary started to decline when unemployment rate increased. Uh, it, it should be noted that the suicide rate of Hungary was among the highest on the world, uh, as we, we, we have discussed earlier. Uh, 35 years ago, the suicide rate of Hungary was 46, 46, 35 years ago. At that time, the suicide rate of Greece was almost four, ten, more than 10 times difference. But uh, the, in the last 35 years, the suicide rate of Hungary declined year by year steady consequent decline year by year and in 2019 it was 16 46 to 16 
it is a 65% decline. There are a, a, a lot of explanation or a lot of factors that can explain this big decline, but, but uh, it, it is not the topic of this lecture, but I should mention that we have uh, made a lot of studies and deep analysis, and we have found that the, the better treatment of mood disorders is the main factor in this very, very favorable change because 65% uh, uh, decline in suicide mortality and the prescription of antidepressants, which is just a proxy marker, I know, prescription of antidepressants increased 14 folds during these 36 years. But, but, but uh, uh, I, <laughs> we, we can discuss it later in a frame of another lecture. Uh, with, the, with the cooperation of Professor Funtulakis, we have also found that the relationship between unemployment and suicide is not so direct that somebody became unemployed today and will suicide tomorrow. Uh, we have found that permanent un unemployment is needed in quotation marks and about three to five years delay is between became unemployed and depression and uh, you know depression and suicide are very strongly related it means that the, the transmitter between unemployment and suicide is major mental disorder particularly depression there are several uh, review papers indicating that the relationship between unemployment and suicide is bi bidirectional. Unemployment can result in provoke or can be a risk factor for depression and suicide. But the other side, it is also true that depression can frequently result in unemployment and uh, unemployment and depression together is a very high risk for suicide behavior. And uh, another study has shown that unemployment is an extremely powerful indicator of the rates of serious mental illness. And the Italian study also has shown that unemployment rates increased with increasing mental illness severity. Mental illness uh, it alone is not enough because the majority or, or a, a big part of mental illness are not so severe, fortunately. And more and more mental disorder patients could be treated out as outpatient on the outpatient basis. But the more severe is the, the illness, mostly depression, schizophrenia, or mania, of course. <laughs> the bipolar patients create the most life events because, you know, the life events can be independent something tragedy, independently of, of mind behavior, but can be dependent. And, and bipolar patients, particularly bipolar one patients, during the manic phase, create a lot of, of, of conflicts, and which later can be a risk factor for suicide behavior if bipolar one patient switch from mania into depression. Also, Professor Funtulakis and a lot of his European colleagues have investigated this relationship and which is the most important, uh, at least from my side, that economic environment. Unemployment is okay, but economic environment, it is a more precise because uh, unemployment, the, the category of unemployment is, is very heterogeneous. Is, as I have mentioned, to be unemployed for, for three months is not the same to be unemployed for several years. Uh, and what is the situation in Greece? If I have mentioned <laughs> Professor Funtulakis, uh, so suicide rate of Greece in 2000 was 3.5. And 15 years later, it became almost five, which is 33% increase. 
and the unemployment rate correlated with suicide rate only in males younger than 65 years old. Okay, of course, it is, it is very important. Uh, income, income, uh, per capita income, income is very strongly related, of course, to unemployment. It is not surprise that is the relationship. Uh, access to health care and health insurance. It is also very well demonstrated a significant relationship both on individual and population level. This is a very so-called old study conducted about 30 years ago, when we analyzed the suicide rate, prevalence of diagnosed depression and prevalence of working physicians in Hungary. And uh, we have found, uh, we, we analyzed 20 regions of Hungary. The, Hungary. the size of Hungary is 10 million people. 10 million people, and we have 19 counties and uh, one Budapest, and this way we, we had 20 regions, and the, the, the size of population in each in, in every region, every region average is half million. And this way, uh, the statistical analysis is, is possible, and we have found that the higher is the rate of working doctors in the given region, the higher is the rate of reported higher is the rate of diagnosed depression, and lower is the suicide rate. It should be noted that in another study we have also found that, the, uh, that no such relationship is uh, between schizophrenia. But it is not a surprise, because all psychological autopsy studies show that the rate of schizophrenia among suicide victims in Hungary was 8%. And this 8% is not big enough to make a statistical association. But the rate of mood disorder or depression, major depression in, among suicide victims, 60 to 8 to 70%. And this way, this, this was probably the first study on the world, nobody quotes, when we demonstrated that access to health care is very important uh, for. Uh, 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 diagnosing depression and for preventing suicide, it should be noted that that, that year's uh, 1993, it was published in 1993, but the, the study is on the data on 1986, where the suicide rate of Hungary was on the top. Uh, the depression was very much underdiagnosed. But uh, fortunately, the situation became better and better. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, 14 uh, 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 times increase the antidepressants prescription also indicates that the diagnosed depression in Hungary increased also. Uh, this study has been supported by American uh, uh, study by Professor Tondo. Professor Balder Sarini have mentioned this study. It has been supported in, in Austria, in Finland, and in Slovenia, showing that availability of mental health services and quality of depressive disorder treatment significant relation with suicide. Divorce, separation, isolation, also very well known that there is a significant relationship on individual and population level. Uh, the study uh, I have mentioned earlier among suicide cases, the rate of separation and divorce was 33%. The same in controls was exactly the half, 75%. But Looking at these relationship on the level of general population of Hungary, uh, with uh, Professor David Lester, we have found that the higher is the rate of divorce in a given region more than 30 years ago, the higher is the rate of suicide. Uh, looking at the whole population of Hungary, uh, 
in, in, in one year, the, the number of suicide victims in Hungary in last year was 1,700, 1, but that year, the, the number of suicide victims was much higher. And we have also found that marriage was a significant protective risk factor against suicide, that is in statistical relationship. But looking at the decline of uh, suicide mortality in different uh, subgroups of suicide victims in 2000, and 16 years later, we have seen that the greatest decline in suicide mortality, almost 60% decline, was among married persons. Widow persons decreased the second greatest among 56%. Separated or single uh, persons suicide is decreased by 28 or 26%. And it also indicates from, from a very, very different point of view that we have found the same marriage is a protective factor for suicide, but it does not mean that widowhood is also protective, but it, it also needs a very, very detailed discussion. Yes, yes, another study also from Italy also shows that the protective impact of marriage or living together is higher for suicide than for natural causes of death. Separation, separation and divorce, it is, it is practically the same. Nowadays, nowadays in, in Hungary, the, the rate of divorce decreased because the, the rate of marriage also decreases, of course. Life events, it is very well known that life events can this factor for suicidal behavior, either early negative life events, it is very well demonstrated that in suicide victims and the suicide attempt as the rate of early negative life events is significantly higher than in the controls or non-suicidal mood disorder, or psychiatric patients. And uh, uh, life events in adulthood can be a trigger of suicide, but, but suicide is really a very complex and suicide is never the consequence of life events alone. Looking at, again, <laughs> or case control studies, and uh, we have also found that among the 194 suicide cases, the adverse life events in the last three months were more than 40%, and the same in control population was just 17%, more than double difference. Uh, religiosity, significant relationship, both on individual and population level. Again, the same study. <laughs> don't, don't believe that we have just one study. <laughs> We have published several studies, but this study is, is a, a very good for demonstrating the psychosocial risk factors for suicide in Hungary. And the practicing religion is, is almost 16% in cases, and among controls is almost 35%. It is also a double difference. Yes, uh, religion is protective factor against suicide, regardless of the nature of religion. Looking at the whole population of Hungary and using the database of Central Statistical Office of Hungary, we have also found that lack of religious integration was related significantly higher suicide risk. Uh, Professor Pompili from Rome, who is among the leading experts of suicide. I am sure everybody know him. Uh, have made a comment to a paper, British Journal of Psychiatry, and uh, he, he pointed out that stigmatization of mental illness can prevent people 
for seeking treatment and uh, many, many stigmatized psychiatric patients believe that the suicide is the best resolution. And it is, of course, not the case. What are the uh, environmental factors related to suicide? Geography, climatic factors, socio-cultural factors, elementary factors, COVID-19 pandemic, and later we thought. Geographic factors. We, we have discussed it earlier latitude, longitude, and altitude, elevation, sunlight, temperature, air pollution, green spaces, seasonality, periodicity, lithium in drinking water, and arsenic in drinking water, latitude. The higher is the latitude, the higher is the suicide rate, significant relationship on both hemispheres. More close is the the, the, the given country or, or region to the equator, the, the lower is the suicide, and it is, it is also true on the south and hemisphere. But it's very important to note, as I have mentioned earlier, the hypertimic temperament is protective against suicide. And, and in this uh, very interesting Japanese study, when the authors investigated the temperament, the, the prevalence, prevalence of different affective temperaments on different latitudes, in Japanese Sapporo, Goshiega and Oita, 43, 60, uh, 36 and 33, uh, great. And they have found the lower latitude, more close to the equator, more sunshine, more hypertimic temperament as there are a lot of papers investigating this relationship. And uh, as I mentioned, hypertimic temperament is the only temperament out of the five creperi notiscal temperament, which are protective against suicide. And this relationship has been found in every country, when in Hungary, in Italy, in the United States, and so on and so on. Longitude. Longitude suicide rates rates are also significantly related to longitude. Western United States are higher, and in Eastern Europe, uh, Professor Funtulakis and, and, and Professor Valdesarini also have mentioned. And it means in Europe, not just south east, south north. And this way, in if we look at the map of Hungary. The higher is the suicide rate in north east altitude. It's very important. As I have mentioned, longitude, latitude, longitude, and altitude. Because there are at least two American studies looking at more than 2,000 counties in the United States and significant positive association with the altitude or elevation and suicide mortality, even after controlling for age, percent of male, percent of wife, or household income, population density, and, and the weapon, having a weapon, a guns, then it's very interesting. It's very interesting and in, in my view, it can explain some Western, Eastern, Western difference in suicide rate in the United States. Significant association of persons, another study. And the explanation was hypoxia, temperature, lot of fish consumption, it is my explanation low lithium in drinking water. It is also my, my explanation because we have discussed earlier that lithium in drinking water is also strongly related to suicide behavior. The lower is the lithium in drinking water, the higher is the suicide rate. Almost every study has found this. It is also a different question. It is 
this very important topic, how, how can be it? Because lithium in drinking water is, is at least 500 or, or 800 times lower than in the therapeutic dose. But, but the relationship uh, between lithium in drinking water and suicide, it is, it is quite strong. And uh, I have mentioned to, to some uh, Austrian colleagues, Professor Kapusta, that it would be interesting to look at the lithium in drinking water in high mountains. And uh, it is another study, which is not, not the central topic of my lecture, but it has been found. The higher is the elevation, the higher is the altitude, the lower is the lithium in drinking water. But some summary, summarizing this, the geography, latitude, altitude, and elevation makes the, the relationship between suicide and some geographic factor three-dimensional. And it can explain. I, I am not sure that it is the full explanation because the Professor Funtulakis and the Professor Baldessani have mentioned several other factors. It, it, I am not sure it is the full explanation, but I think it is one important part of this. Air pollution, statistical association between air, pol air pollution and suicide risk, significant association, very small effect size, and also a statistical association between green spaces and suicide rates. The higher is, the higher are the green spaces, the, the lower is the suicide rates, but they are related because there are more green spaces, lower suicide rate, but more green spaces means less air pollution. Seasonality. Seasonality of suicide is also a very well-known phenomenon. Spring and early summer peak and winter low, it is a typical pattern, which is also true for the Southern Hemisphere. It relates the, the name of the season, not, not to the name of the month. Spring, early summer peak, winter low. But dividing the suicide victims in two, at least two parts, mood disorder related suicide and other, we, have, we can see that suicide related to mood disorders have significantly more pronounced uh, seasonality of suicide than non-mood disorder suicide victims. And this way, uh, we, we can detect the effect of better treatment of mood disorder in declining suicide rate, because we have found, we published another paper, which is also not the topic of this lecture, that uh, the, the, the the bigger is the increase of antidepressants prescription or antidepressants use in the given regions, the, the smaller is the seasonality, the smaller is the amplitude of seasonality of suicide. Uh, very, very interesting uh, topic, uh, distribution of suicide during the days of the week. And it is very universal finding, Monday peak and weekend low. The low in males in, on, is on Saturday and low in females is on Sunday, but everywhere on the world when they investigated the authors, Monday peak, uh, weekend low. And in contrast to seasonality of suicide, which is most related to biological factors, the, the weekly distribution or weekly fluctuation of suicide behavior is, is only uh, uh, social, social, social factors. It is another topic that you know, Reggio Sheresh, Gloomy Sunday, very famous song, Gloomy Sunday, and the, the composer of this very famous song uh, also committed suicide. Another very important paper, Professor Funtulakis, 
meta analysis and they show that most reports suggest that suicide rates are higher during periods of high temperature, lower infants, and more sunshine, and the change of climate is more important than the permanent factors. Lysium, lysium in drinking water, we have touched several times. These, there are a lot of paper, uh, probably the, the most recent paper on this topic is in the middle of this slide. We have also found that in Hungary, the higher is the lysium in drinking water, the lower is the suicide rate, particularly among males. And it is very important. This also supports the causal relationship because we know that lithium, in addition to its mood stabilizer effect, lithium has a very strong anti-aggressive and anti-impulsive uh, effect. And we know that the suicide of males is more aggressive, more drastic, and more impulsive. This is very important. And uh, Professor Leo Scher from United States also have found and published that lithium has an anti, uh, anti androgen effect, and then the androgens, testosterone, plays also a very important role in suicidal behavior. Yes, and then we can, we can consider that lithium and uh, lithium in drinking water and suicide are really strongly related. Uh, it, is, it is not absolutely resolved problem, but I can believe this causal relationship in, in spite of the fact that, is, as I have mentioned, lithium in drinking water is much more lower than the therapeutic dose, because another study, which I also very frequently show in my other lectures, another American study, uh, endocrinologists have investigated thyroid function and lithium in drinking water and another several biological uh, parameters. And they did not know anything about the lithium and uh, suicide in drinking water. And the study have found that the higher is the lithium in drinking water in the United States, the lower is the thyroid function. Very small difference, but significant. And this is the argument, at least for me, that causes a relationship, because we know that hypothyroidism, decline in thyroid function, is the most important uh, side effects of lithium therapy. But, but we should leave lithium. Meta-analysis, at least 13 or 14 studies, mainly, mainly among males. Arsenic. Uh, we have also investigated the arsenic in drinking water in Hungary because the several regions in Hungary, the level of arsenic was very high. You see, the norm is less than 10 units. Less than 10, it, it is a norm. And we have found that the higher is the arsenic in drinking water in Hungary, the higher is the suicide rate, significant relationship, small effect size. And, and very interestingly, the high arsenic level in drinking water and the low level of lithium in drinking water is particularly characteristics of southeast part of Hungary where the suicide rate is the highest for the last 150 years. You, you can see there is a line in Hungary, suicide rate is more than double in southeast Hungary than in western and north part of Hungary. Yeah. Uh, uh, another environmental alimentation, alcohol, COVID, pandemic and uh, suicide methods, traumatic events. Tryptophan, very interesting study. Professor Voracek from Austria have found that the higher is the tryptophan intake in 
42 countries, the lower is the suicide rate, strong relationship. And tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin, you know. And, and, and serotonin plays a very important role in suicidal behavior. Safe food, safe mood. Uh, the American colleagues from the uh, Professor John Mann research group have found a significant negative correlation between. Uh, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. This is a first study with the fish consumption. Significant negative uh, correlation because between seafood consumption and, and lifetime prevalence of bipolar one, bipolar two, and bipolar spectrum disorders, but not with schizophrenia in 12 countries. It's very, very important. I, I am sure. Yeah, I, I, I am sure you know very well. And. This is the, the study I have mentioned earlier, uh, Professor John Mann and colleagues have found that during the two year follow up, high omega-6 per omega-3 ratio or low omega-3 was a significant predictor of suicide behavior. And you know, omega-3 fatty acid is a very important protective factor, not just for several psychiatric disorders, maybe postpartum mood disorder, but also for cardiovascular disorders. Vitamin D status is also an environmental factor, of course. And a big meta-analysis shows a link between vitamin C deficiency and impulsivity, and aggressivity. And it means that vitamin D deficiency may increase the inflammatory cytokines, kins, cytokines in the brain, which can reduce the serotonin activity. Also, also serotonin, serotonin, alcohol, alcohol, uh, very well known. Uh, maybe you remember, if you are <laughs> not, not, not very young, the Soviet Union uh, perestroika, before the collapse of communism, uh, it was a big development, big changes. Professor, uh, President Gorbachev wanted to, uh, he was really a great man, uh, in my opinion. And uh, during the perestroika, when alcohol prohibition, the decline of Soviet men, the suicide rate of Soviet men declined by 40%. After the alcohol prohibition, suicide rate of Russian males increased again, while the same decline in European community, look at the second and fourth column, was very small. And it means, according to Professor Danuta Wasserman, it is the most, most successful suicide prevention program for males. 40% decline immediately after the alcohol prohibition males and in, in Russian females, this decline was also remarkable, 20%. Uh, the same is in, in Slovenia, in several other countries. Uh, what about the COVID-19 pandemic? It's, it's no doubt that during the COVID-19 pandemic, the incidence, the prevalence of depression particularly severe depression increased dramatically. It is a very well known American study indicating that the, the rate of severe depression during COVID pandemic increased sevenfold. You see the moderately severe depression increased fourfold, moderate depression increased two and a half fold and so on and so on. It's no doubt depression and anxiety disorder increase. And uh, there are several ways when the COVID pandemic can result in higher rate of depression and suicide, depression, anxiety, isolation, illness, where COVID infection itself, unemployment, reduced physical activity, loss events, like grief, uh, 
reused uh, medical and psychological care. And all these factors can result in or can contribute to suicide. But in the first half of the pandemic, uh, looking at this uh, Lancet paper investigating the 16 high income and five middle upper income countries, no significant changes in suicidal behavior has been detected between 1st of January of 2019 and 31 July 2002. But a little bit later in Japan, we have found that the suicide rate increased dramatically. And in Hungary, when I have mentioned that from 1986, when the top suicide rate was big decline till 2019. You see, 2019, the suicide rate of Hungary was about 16. And in 2020, the suicide rate increased dramatically by 16%, particularly among males by 18%. And uh, it is a very, very, very recent study and very recent findings. But uh, according to the Hungarian experts, COVID pandemic could be the only or, or the major factor that can explain this increasing suicide mortality. But of course, very, very well known that the uh, domestic or car exhaust gas, uh, gas carbon monoxide, guns, pesticide, physical availability barriers are very important factors in creating suicidal behavior. And uh, finishing the lecture, we know that uh, suicide is a complex phenomenon. High risk persons in a high risk period became suicidal. High risk patients, a family history of suicide, prior suicide death and impulsivity and so on and so on and so on, life events. Uh, high risk period, acute stressors, spring, early summer, and so on and so on. And protective factors can uh, not, not compensate, but, but can mitigate or minimize the uh, effect of these suicide uh, risk factors, family support, treatment. Treatment, uh, it is very important, as we have learned from the study of Professor Baldessarini. And most interestingly, the majority of psychosocial, uh, the majority of protective factors against suicide are psychosocial in origin, good family, social, financial, medical support, high number of children, pregnancy and postpartum period, practice religion, elimination of lethal methods if it is possible, hypersomnia in major depression, and hypertimic temperament are the two factors which are not social and environmental, but regular physical activity and treated mental disorders are also very important in preventing suicide. And the conclusion, suicide is, is in a given country or region is the result of complex interplay of several factors. And beside the individual suicide risk factors, like depression and so on and so on, there are several psychosocial and environmental correlates of suicidality, which show the significant association but small effect size. And considering all the above, it is very important in suicide prevention. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, dear Professor Zoltan Rimer, for your amazing lecture, thought-provoking lecture.
and we have uh, uh, several questions. Um, one question is posed from Professor Afzal Javed, uh, WP president. Should we consider etiology of suicide as a psychosociological issue or of biological origin? Uh, yes. I, uh, my answer on this question is that in spite of the fact that psychological, demographic, cultural, social aspects are very important in suicidal behavior, persons with suicide attempts or persons who will commit suicide are transferred always to psychiatry and not to office of unemployment, not to psychology, not to church, I am, and, and not, to, not to institute of sociology. And this way, uh, the last word, the first and last word in suicide prevention in, is in our mouths. We are, we take the responsibility. Psychologists, sociologists, demographists, statisticians, uh, teachers, gatekeepers, priests, policemen, fire extinguishers can help us. Because police, policemen are very important in suicide prevention in a given time, in a given place. But at the, the end point of suicidal person is not the soci Institute of Sociology, Institute of Culture, not, not the church. Uh, I, I consider uh, religious in a very important factor. Of course, I won't make a lot of joke, but psychiatry. We, we took the responsibility. And when the patients, the suicidal patients have been discharged from the hospital. We should organize the aftercare. It was also a topic. Fortunately, Hungary is a, a small country, 10 million people, <laughs> relatively small. And the aftercare of psychiatric patients is very well organized. More than 60 years ago, every inpatient department of psychiatry the number of them is about 50. It, all inpatients number of psychiatry were strongly connected to one outpatient department of psychiatry. And when we discharged the patient from our inpatient department, we made discharge paper in five copies, one for patients, one for the chart, one for the GP, one for the outpatient psychiatric department, and then another one. This way, every discharge paper, so sub obligatory, to report to the outpatient department, and many, mostly mood disorder patients are treated or the outpatient department of our inpatient unit, of course, but the majority of discharge psychiatric patients to send immediately, immediately to outpatient care. Yeah, and this way I think suicide is a medical problem with several psychosocial, <laughs> socio, religious, cultural, and so on and so on aspect. But we take we, we took the responsibility. Thank you very much for your answer, Professor Zoltan Rimer, and a couple more questions. Uh, the question. May, of, may, may I comment on yeah. this? This is a question by oh. Afsal Zaved, the president of the World Psychiatric Association. So it's, it's, it's a very important uh, question to tackle, since, uh, as uh, Ross previously said, the attitude is that even from the medical uh, establishment is that this is not a medical uh, problem. In order to to answer such a question, one needs to to see 
and analyze what what the consequences of each acceptance would be uh, and what it predicts. For example, if we accept a, a totally sociocultural origin, then African Americans in the US should, ha should have uh, a higher suicidality rate in comparison to Anglo-Saxons. This is not the case. They don't, they don't even have any comparison of rates. They are ve very low in comparison to the European Americans, uh, which means that uh, sociocultural factors play a, a very minor role in the baseline rates. The baseline rates, it's quite different from the changing rates when something happens, for example, an economic crisis. The baseline rates are not very much affected by sociocultural uh, issues. For example, Hungary had similar suicidal rates during the, the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, during the Soviet era, during the uh, post-Soviet era, during the economic problems, during in Hungary, no matter the situation, the political economic situation, uh, suicides were high. How about religion? Kazakhstan is Muslim, Egypt is Muslim. Kazakhstan is close to Russia in terms of rates. Egypt is close to Greece. Greece is Orthodox, Russia is Orthodox. No comparison of rates. Italy is Catholic, Poland is Catholic. There is no comparison of, of the rates. So, so religion per se, the type of religion, not religiosity, the type of religion does not seem to play a major role. So sociocultural issues do not seem to be a major issue concerning baseline characteristics, baseline rates. Now, the second thing we need to see is what kind of problem is that? It is a rare condition. In, in, in medicine, rare conditions are those who are very rare as events, they are below 1%. And suicidality, death by suicide, is 10, 1 in 10,000 per year. It's, it's a very rare condition. Now, very rare conditions are highly unlikely to be sociocultural and very, very rarely, very highly unlikely to, to be the result of something that it is easily, easily manipulated and affects large Na, uh, masses of the population. The next thing is that we the highest number of uh, suicides is between uh, is in males aged 30 to 55 or 60 something like that which means that it's not a developmental thing because most of uh, victims of suicide have matured. It's not genetic hardly genetic hardwired but occurs when uh, a more or less mature uh, brain faces multiple challenges. And um, I forgot the last thing. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, but, God, uh, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> All these, all these characteristics, all these characteristics of the uh, of the problem of suicidality uh, means that the uh, oh yes, the, the last thing is that. Uh, 90% of victims by autopsy uh, suffer from a, a major mental disorder, either schizophrenia or depression. And rates of schizophrenia are similar across countries. Rates of depression might vary a little bit, but it's not 10 times uh, more uh, from country to country as suicidality is, which means that mental disorder is probably a prerequisite but it's not sufficient as a condition to cause suicide. So there is something that adds on the presence of a mental disorder. This is why Hungary, which has similar depression rates in comparison to Greece, has higher suicidality. Something adds on that, on a more or less mature but problematic psychological function at the age of 40, let's say, in males, not really in females, a very few females die. Uh, to, to cut uh, a long uh, story short, this is, this is the story, this is a similar story of type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is something that evolves. It might be caused by behavioral, by food consumption. 
it changes the system of reacting to the environment to glucose and eventually causes structural damage. So it's basically biological, but it's a, a, it's, it's a problematic response to, to, to challenges in, in, and insults of midlife. Very good comment, and I should continue. You are right, because as Professor Funtulakis knows the Hungarian situation very well, you, you can see we have made a lot of papers. Uh, first, during the time of communism, as you have mentioned, 40, 30, 40, 50 years ago, the suicide rate of Hungary was the, the highest on the world or among the three highest. But that time when the suicide rate of Hungary was 46, the, the same rate in Poland, also the same communist bloc, 14. Bulgaria, the same time, 12. And the second biggest suicide rate on the world, that time, 40 years ago, was in Denmark. The third suicide rate in the world was in Austria. And Belgium and Switzerland have shown also very high suicide rate, like by Serbia, Romania, Poland, as I have mentioned, and so have low. And it also supports that the view of Professor Funtulak is that it was not a not an economical, not a political problem. Of course, economical political problems can influence some aspects. Well, second, Hungarians living outside of the country. Uh, there are about 4 million Hungarians living outside, mainly in, in Romania, Slovakia, and so on and so on, have the same suicide rate as in Hungary, and very different from the suicide rate of native Rom Romanians, Serbians, Slovakians, and so on. And immigrants, Hungarian, Hungarian immigrants, in United States and Australia have the same uh, rate of suicide as in, in Hungary. And they are very different from the suicide rate of Australians and uh, the Americans and so on and so on. It, it, it also indicates a strong biological genetic genetic factors. And uh, Professor Funtulakis is right uh, when he mentioned that the depression prevalence is not very different, uh, practically the same in Greece and in Hungary. But the bipolar disorder is very high in Hungary. The lifetime rate of bipolar 1 plus bipolar 2 disorder in Hungary is 5%. We published it in the Journal of Affective Disorder several years ago. And it can be also related to the very uh, originally very high suicide rate of Hungary, because as we have seen, bipolar disorder carries much, much more higher risk of suicide than other form of depression. Very complex, very complex. And uh, if uh, at least uh, Zoltan, I made that. Zoltan, it's also the Finno-Altaic, the Finno-Hungarian hypothesis. Yes, 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 a Slovenian colleague, Marusic, presented Marusic, Andrei Marusic, unfortunately died. The Yi share curve from Baltic countries, from Ukraine, Hungary. Based on the genetic map uh, by Cavalli Sforza, yeah. published in 1994. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. There is a J starting J. From, from Finland and goes by, down to Hungary, a J of suicidality. Absolutely. And the title Europe. of this paper in British Journal, Suicide Does Not No Border. Uh, I, I just, just uh, wish to mention that I made an informal study looking at the position of notes in national anthems and suicide rates uh, based on data, on suicide data on 1986, I have chosen four European countries. Hungary, above suicide rate above 40. Greece, suicide rate four. And two in middle, Austria, suicide rate 28. Poland, 
suicide rate 14. 46, Hungary, 28, Austria, 14, Poland, 4, Greece. And I counted the position of notes in the national anthems. And as I have expected, the, the higher is the suicide rate, Hungary, the higher is the rate of deep notes. I published many years ago. And it's very interesting because, you know, Hungarian national anthem is very sad. And in comparison, the Greek national anthems like, like a marsh. What and was Italian this, also. What was this uh, song of the mid-war in Hungary, the Hungarian Rhapsody, uh, that was uh, linked to... Uh, Suicide. Gloomy Sunday. Gloomy Sunday. Gloomy, Gloomy Sunday. Gloomy Sunday. Which, which there, is, there is a similar song in Greek gloomy Sunday, but it's very, very uh, joyful, although the, the, the lyrics are very sad. The, the music is very joyful. The lyrics are essentially the same. Mm -hmm. The lyrics say the same things, but the music is completely different. Oh, yes, yes. And Sunday. my study on national anthems has been supported by the study of David Lester, who analyzed my computer he published in Psychological Report several years ago that he really found uh, using a, a computer analysis that the higher is the deep notes in national anthem, the higher is the suicide rate. It's, it's very interesting because the composer of Hungarian national anthem also has a bipolar two disorder. And the lyrics, the lyrics is the first more, uh, words, dear God, give good mood to the Hungarian. The Hungarian national anthem starts with these words. This God give good mood to the Hungarian. And a little bit later, this nation has been punished even for the future. The, the, the writer of this lyric of Nisian national anthems, he won on competition. Bipolar to disorder, very well documented bipolar to disorder. Creativity and bipolarity are strongly related. Yeah. Next question, Daria, do we have any yes, other questions? Yes, we have. Thank you very much, Professor Kostas Fontoulakis, for your valuable uh, commentaries and interesting discussion with Professor Zoltan Rimer. We have a couple more questions. One uh, question from uh, uh, Dr. Senat uh, Hasanagic, uh, he asks, what is the relationship between suicidality and uh, psychological, physical, sexual trauma at individual and populational level? Yes, yes, very good question. We have also investigated, but uh, international literature uh, published some several papers about early yeah, uh, childhood negative life events, uh, abuse, child abuse, physical abuse, physical neglect, sexual abuse, and the significant relationship between adulthood suicide and suicide attempt. And we have investigated the temperament of mood disorder patients who had early childhood abuse or not. And we have found, supporting the international literature, that mood disorder patients who made suicide attempt had significantly more frequent and significantly more severe irritable and cyclotimic temperament, which are uh, suicide risk factors. And there are several studies mainly from from united states showing that suicide attempters even with mood disorder or without mood disorder it is quite rare of course uh, suicide attempters who had life uh, early childhood life events report significantly more aggressive features Early negative life events can result in 
irritable or cyclotimic temperament can not, not result in it is too strong, but statistical association is, is, is true. And more aggressive, more impulsive features. And we know irritable temperament, cyclotimic temperament, aggressivity and impulsivity are strongly related to suicidal behavior. And this way, uh, we think that, that uh, this is a very complex but real problem. And if you look at the, the fact that bipolar and unipolar and alcoholic parents can create significantly more early negative life events or abuse than healthy parents. And this way, if somebody have a family history of psychiatric disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and so on, alcoholism, drug addiction, uh, there are two very important factors, having a genetic predisposition, and because the psychiatric illness of the parents, this baby or this small child will suffer a lot of early negative life events, abuse. This is very, very dangerous combination, dangerous constellation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zoltan Rimer. And um, Anonymous attendee asks, um, referring to the marriage as a protective factor to suicide, does the quality of it play, plays a role? Or was it found independently? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's it's very important question because it, it, it is a problem of statistics. Statistically, marriage is, is a protective factor and separation is, is a, also a, a provo provoking factor. But the quality of marriage is not the same and the separation or divorce can be a, re a resolution of a very conflictuous family situation. And if, if we, we could divide uh, the, the marriage population into two parts or divorce, uh, we, we could find a more strong association with good marriage and positive as a protective factor and, and, uh, and the provoking factor and conflictuous marriage or separation. And uh, this way, this way I, I think this, this statistical association is, is valid, but in the majority of cases, marriage is a real protective factor, but in, in many, many cases, uh, divorce or separation gives a resolution of the problem. And the, the, the situation is very interesting. If you look at the widowhood, widow, uh, to, to become widow, is also a special form of separation. And if, if, if not, you are the cause of the death of, of your parents, husband, wife, it is an independent factor. And the widowhood is, is, is a very good so-called model in this respect, because it, it, is, it is not the same as separation because of of five years long uh, conflict with marriage and after widow, uh, after separation or divorce, or uh, relative or my wife or, or uh, the husband or the wife died by accident or the illness. It is very different. Well, thank you very much. So it's not so easy if you marry and move closer to Equator, uh, have a good partner or relationship and so on um, not so easy and uh, uh, one last question um, uh, can aggression be the other side of depression recently in greece there is an increase in women's abuse and uh, femicides or women killings and can we blame depression for this phenomenon yes i the, i, I think yeah Aggressive, aggressive, and impulsive personality features are very important psychological characteristics. And 
if somebody became depressed, this aggressive, impulsive personality feature became active and, uh, and support the hypothesis or the statement of Sigmund Freud that uh, suicide is a clear auto-aggression when the aggression is directed for itself. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, looking at the criminal persons, aggressive persons who, who, who performed aggressive criminality have significantly higher rate of suicide attempt even before the first crime. It's very important. And the non white collar uh, uh, um, criminal, it is not true for them. Only aggressive uh, criminals have much more positive family history of suicide and much more, uh, much higher rate of uh, suicide attempts even before the first criminal act. It's very important. But up because after it is, it depends on several other factors, but before that, it's victimology. Daria, may I make a clarification on the previous question? Thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, mentioned that there is an increase in uh, violence uh, against women and uh, uh, femicides in, in Greece recently. This is the prevailing picture in the media and the social media, but we don't know whether it is really true. Uh, what we do know is that uh, for the last 20 years, we have approximately, give or take, 150 deaths by homicide. 100 are males and 50 are female victims. And half of the, these 50 are what we say, we, we used to say passion crimes, and now we call them uh, femicide. Uh, it does not seem there is uh, an increasing trend. Uh, on average, there are 20 to 25 per year of these deaths. And uh, the year uh, 2020, if, if I am correct, at least Merope Zufi, a member of the parliament, uh, last week said that last year we had 17 such deaths, which means that there was not an increase. Now, the Elstat, the official statistics, will come out in one or two years. So until then, we, we, we don't know. But there is not um, a, an evidence-based picture that there is any increase. The media, of course, focus on this, but we don't really know. And as for domestic violence, this is what we, 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 will, we don't know and we will never know the real, the real picture. Mm -hmm. To add to what Zoltan said, in, in uh, countries like Mexico, where homicides are at the highest, you don't see any uh, correlation between homicides and suicides because there is a, a ceiling effect. Uh, in, in Europe, you see a strong correlation and they go together. Homicides and suicides go together usually. In Asia, there is an intermediate uh, situation because there are countries with high uh, homicidality and it's, it's a more complex. And also in Africa, there are, no, there are no data in Africa for Africa. But in Europe, there is a strong correlation as Zoltan said, but in countries, especially in the Americas, there is no correlation because suicide, uh, homicide rates have a floor, uh, a ceiling effect. So there is no statistical uh, power there. But the, 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 the old psychoanalytical argument that you either kill or die, it's not, you, you, do, the, you do both. <laughs> you do both. Thank you very much. So, uh, this is all about the questions from the audience. Um, thank you very much for interesting discussion. Thank you to our amazing speakers, Professor Rosbald de Serini, Professor Zoltan Riemer, uh, to Professor Avzal Javed and Professor Peter Marozov for the WPA support, and uh, to our mentor and main organizer of the um, MIDI expert uh, webinars, Professor Konstantinos Fontolakis. Thank you very much to the uh, co-moderator, 
Professor Eva Maria Tsopakis and uh, Georgos uh, from Let's Study Greece for amazing moderation of each of the webinars. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice uh, day, life till 100. <laughs> Thank you, Darian. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.